there's a lot of concerns, and I hear this being thrown around with all these diets, that you can't eat fats and carbs together because of the Randall cycle, that's going to cause weight gain. So that's the other physiological mechanism that's invoked in these diets. And this is driven from a major misunderstanding of the Randall cycle and something that I think is really driving people in the wrong direction. And so this is something that is very important to highlight. So when we actually look at what the Randall cycle is dictating, how it actually functions, this is something that starts in the mitochondria and basically determines what kind of fuel the mitochondria will be using, whether it'll be fat or carbohydrates. And if the mitochondria is using fat, it reduces the uptake and utilization of carbs, and then vice versa. If the mitochondria is using glucose or carbohydrates, it reduces the utilization and uptake of fat. Because, you know, there's a, within a cell, there's a number of processes that are kind of dependent on each other. This generally would suggest that within a single cell, it's mostly going to be using either carbohydrates or fat. It's not going to be using both at the same time. What this does not mean is that your body can't be using both carbohydrates and fats at the same time. What it also does not mean is that we can't consume multiple fuels at the same time and utilize them at the same time. It also doesn't even mean that one tissue, one organ system can't be using both carbs, fats, or other fuels at the same time. And in fact, we know that none of those things are actually true. There's nothing about the Randall cycle that dictates that your muscles can't be using fat while your brain is using glucose. There's also nothing about the Randall cycle that dictates that part of your brain could be using ketones while part of it could be using glucose. Or that your liver could be utilizing glucose or fructose while your kidneys, or let's say your heart is a better example. Your heart's your heart is using mostly fat. There's nothing about the Randall cycle that dictates those things. And there's nothing about it that dictates that if you eat both of those at the same time, you're going to confuse your body and mess up the whole system. And all of a sudden, because there's fat in the bloodstream, your brain is no longer going to be able to use glucose or your liver is no longer going to be able to use glucose or that uh, because there's glucose in your bloodstream, the muscles are no longer going to be able to use fat for a fuel or your heart won't be able to use fat as a fuel. These are total misapplications of the Randall cycle coming from a deep misunderstanding of the Randall cycle. And it's something that I see not only in the bioenergetic sphere and in, you know, in promoting these diets, but also on the flip side, on the low carb side, where they'll say the same thing. You have to either have fats or carbs. You can't have both. If you're having fat, it's going to interfere with carb utilization. So that's kind of the broad overview here. And just to clarify on the flip side, what I am saying is that you can have both carbs and fats in a meal in different proportions And our bodies actually do a fantastic job of utilizing both of them in the same ratios that we're getting them. So there are studies looking at this. And what they basically find is that the respiratory quotient reflects the food quotient. What that means is basically the respiratory quotient is a way that we measure how much fat and carbohydrates our bodies are using. It's never one or the other. It's always some combination of both, but it's a sliding scale that tells us how much of each we're using. The food quotient is looking at the ratio of carbs and fats in the food that we're eating. And what they generally find is that the amount of carbs and fat that our bodies are using is directly determined and directly reflects the amounts of carbs and fats that we're consuming. So if we're consuming 80% carbs and 20% fats, our bodies are generally utilizing 80% carbs and 20% fats as their fuel. If we're eating 20% uh, carbs and 80% fat, again, the same for the body. And if we're eating 50% carbs and 50% fats, the body is doing the same. It's utilizing 50% carbs and 50% fats. The, there are certain exceptions, but the exceptions tend to come at the extremes. If you're eating an extremely low fat diet, you're actually going to be burning more fat than you take in because there's a number of tissues that tend to prefer fat as a fuel. And the same thing, if you're using a very low carbohydrate diet, you're going to be burning more carbs than you take in because certain uh, tissues like to utilize carbohydrates. And so you have, you know, on the low carb diet, you have the conversion from protein and other substrates into carbs. And on the low fat diet, you have the conversion of carbs into fat to make up that difference. But the important point to drive home here is that there is nothing that dictates that you can only choose one fuel or the other. Now, I know we were just going through studies showing that low fat improves insulin resistance. This is not because the body can't use both at the same time. And there's tons and tons of examples, myself included, of people who are consuming moderate amounts of both carbs and fat, or you could even say high amounts of both carbs and fat without any issue in terms of insulin sensitivity or weight. And this is historically, I I would argue, what we were eating. And when we look at various diets, uh, you know, cookbooks and things like that from, you know, even a hundred years ago and and prior to that, where people were very lean, there wasn't this obesity issue. People were eating both carbs and fats. And I'll be doing uh, some further videos on this later on and digging into all that. 
But the short of it being that the problem is not consuming both of those together. Part of the reason why the low fat diets work in cases like insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity is because in those states, we tend to have very high stress hormones. When we have high stress hormones, our body is already shifting more toward utilizing fats. And we're also releasing a lot more fats from the fat stores. So just that baseline in those states, we're already leaning more on the fat oxidation side. So we don't need very much more fat to kind of meet our needs there. Our needs for fat are much lower because we have a lot more being released from the fat tissue at all times and a lot more being utilized anyway. And so our needs for fat are much lower. And if we exceed those, then in a case like that, we are going to get to a point where the tissues that actually need to utilize the carbs and do much better utilizing the carbs are going to be interfered with because we're getting so much fat that it's putting us into some level of a stress state, which drives the chronic glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol, and other uh, hormonal states that we see in type 2 diabetes. So if the body is in a state where it's stuck mostly utilizing fats, and I should say on top of that, the other huge component is that there's already problems with glucose metabolism in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. That's what's driving all of those things. And so when we're in a state like that, we're essentially stuck burning fat. And so the other piece here is that when we lower those fats significantly, we can kind of force the utilization of carbohydrates by reducing this thing that interferes with carbohydrate and oxidation. It doesn't necessarily directly fix the underlying issue of what's causing the insulin resistance, but it helps, helps us kind of circumvent it because we're stuck in this fat burning kind of state. So the Randall cycle comes into play here in terms of what's going on in the tissues or inside the cells where they are stuck burning fat because they can't properly oxidize glucose. And if you take that fat away, you kind of force them to utilize the glucose again. There's an aspect like that. That part is, is properly applied. But this, this general idea that we can't be consuming carbs and fats in moderate amounts, equal amounts, or in any middle combination is a total misapplication of the Randall cycle. And in addition to that, to suggest that we have to have them at different meals is equivalently inaccurate in terms of application. Uh, there's no need to, like, even if you're on a low fat diet, let's say, you know, uh, 10 or 20%, you know, which you, as we saw in those earlier studies, 20% is pretty effective when it comes to a low fat diet. Even if you're there, that doesn't mean you have to have that 20% of your fat calories all at the same meal and separated from the carbs. You can have those in balanced amounts throughout the day alongside the carbs, which we'll be mentioning here in a moment is one of the recommendations I would have, uh, if you are trying a, a low fat diet or if you're looking to modify some of these kind of sugar-based diets. All right, so there are a couple of other things to mention here, a couple of other concerns when it comes to these different sugar diets, I'll call them, you know, sugar diet, honey diet, fructonin diet, and all the rest. And that's that with an excessively low fat diet, pretty consistently in the research, we see lower reproductive hormones. We see lower testosterone and lower DHT levels as an example in men. This is, of course, not something that I think most people would want, when they're trying to implement these diets. And I will say, if you're losing a lot of body fat, that is probably outweighing this decrease in testosterone and DHT. You're probably having much lower estrogen and you probably actually see improvements here, but that's more driven by the weight loss than the diet. And the longer you continue on it, the more you're going to see the opposite effect of decreased uh, pro-metabolic reproductive hormones. And so what we'd really want to do is decrease the weight without that pressure downward on the androgenic hormones. So just a quick one to mention here in terms of the hormonal effects of these diets. And of course, testosterone is important for maintaining the lean mass and bone mass that we're already concerned about on these sorts of diets. Now, there's another one here, which is the potential concerns when it comes to our digestive health on these diets. When we're eating a very low-fat diet, one thing that we're going to see is reduced bile flow. And that makes sense because bile is one of its main jobs is digesting fat. So if we have less fat coming in, you could say, well, we have a reduced need for bile. But that's not the only thing that bile does. Bile has a really strong antibacterial effect in the small intestine, so it helps to keep our small intestine clear of bacteria, which it should be, helps to basically prevent SIBO from developing. And there are some other effects as well of bile. It helps to clear out things from the liver that basically like toxic, um, toxic inputs that we want to clear out, things like estrogen, things like pesticides, things like heavy metals, a lot of those clear out through the bile. And so if we have reduced bile flow, we'll generally have reduced clearance of those things as well at the liver. And then a couple of other things to consider about the relationship between fat consumption and digestion is that fats and especially saturated fats have antimicrobial effects themselves. They have antibacterial and antifungal effects. So they help to keep the intestines clear through that mechanism as well. And they also directly help with the clearance of endotoxin 
from the intestines by activating a lipid raft mediated mechanism of basically uh, causing proper absorption of endotoxin instead of it going via intestinal permeability. We have a more constructive way of absorbing it, bringing it to the liver to uh, detoxify. And that's something that's supported by saturated fats. Again, if we're having a very low fat diet, we're then left with some potential issues here of being more prone to SIBO, more prone to fungal issues as well, and being more prone to potential endotoxin issues because of uh, basically impaired ability to clear it. It's also worth mentioning that FGF21 itself actually reduces bile acid production. So not only is the low fat diet going to be reducing bile flow, but the low protein diet is also going to be reducing bile flow and bile acid production. Now, one of the caveats here, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, is that if you have problems digesting fat and or protein, bile flow issues are already probably present. And often you can actually get congestion in the gallbladder uh, or problems with bile uh, production in the liver, bile acid production or other aspects there that are causing inflammation and irritation there. And if that's the case, taking out the fat, keeping the protein low and lowering bile flow will lead to relief. It will relie- like lead to benefits in terms of how you feel in those situations. But long-term, we're not actually fixing the problem. We'll be much more prone to those other issues I'd mentioned, like increased bacterial overgrowth and the reduced ability to clear uh, harmful things through the liver's detoxification processes. So this is still not an ideal route to go, but it can lead to those kind of short-term benefits, or it could be one of the reasons why you notice some benefits on these diets. If you enjoyed that clip, you'll definitely want to download the free Energy Balance Food Guide. The Energy Balance Food Guide will help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The Food Guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com guide to download your free Energy Balance Food Guide.